This conference will now be recorded. Assalamu alaikum wa Welcome to this uh, lecture two of your emergency medicine course on MD4. Uh, this is about pediatric surgical emergencies, the emergencies which have been uh, defined in your syllabus. Uh, most of the contents we have already uh, read in the last MD3 surgery course. So I hope it will uh, be an easier uh, lecture, uh, more of a revision and uh, some new uh, diseases will be added and uh, some new concepts will be added, keeping in view that we are only dealing with the emergency portion of it and uh, we'll try to skip the surgical uh, procedure part of it. So there are three uh, diseases uh, which need to be uh, elaborated in this lecture as per your syllabus. There are neonatal obstructive jaundice, neonatal intestinal obstruction, neonatal major abdominal defects. Obstructive jaundice in infants. So physiological jaundice is seen frequently in the first uh, two weeks and is secondary to the functional immaturity of the neonatal liver. There is more of uh, blood breakage than the liver can uh, actually metabolize it and the patient gets uh, physiological jaundice. But deep or rapidly developing jaundice or jaundice that appears uh, to persist in the third week is not likely to be physiological. And it implies either there is hemolysis or there is infection or there is obstruction or some error of metabolism maybe there. Uh, and it needs some serious and urgent investigation and treatment. If it is accompanied by pale, acolytic stools, dark urine, and elevated conjugated bilirubin, an obstructive jaundice has to be considered. All points towards obstruction. Obstructive jaundice in infancy, it's, uh, it's always pathological and indicates serious hepatobiliary uh, hepatob dysfunction. Early detection and timely and Accurate diagnosis is very important for successful treatment and an optimal prognosis. The more the delay, the more the problems. If the serum bilirubin level is more than 20%, the direct is the direct bilirubin is more than 20% of the total bilirubin, it, it requires us to rule out obstruction. So if the bilirubin level is less than five milligram and direct is more than one milligram, which means more than 20 percent, or 20 more than 20 percent in, in above the, these levels, we have to do not obstruction. Some major causes of non-physiological neonatal jaundice, surgical and medical, surgical, biliary atresia. We have discussed this last year also. Choridococyst, it is uh, a new uh, uh, this uh, condition we didn't discuss in the surgical uh, the surgical. Uh, syllabus last year. In species is bio, again, this is a, a new condition. Then medical disorders, they will more be taken by the pediatric uh, medicine people. Breast milk, jaundice, neonatal hepatitis, sepsis, uh, inborn errors of metabolism, endocrine disorders, and uh, uh, some other these uh, medical disorders. So for us, biliary atresia, cardiacal system, in species, in the uh, uh, bile. These are the three conditions which we will try to elaborate. Biliary atresia, we have discussed last year also, it's a progressive obliterative disorder of the bile ducts and it presents in the first few weeks of life. It's more common in boys. Uh, you see the diagram. Here, there's a Kasai classification. It has type one, two, and three. Type 3 is the commonest, and we're mostly dwelling about that. Uh, type 1 is the least, uh, this uh, deformity, uh, has the least deformity. And as we progress it through type 2 to type 3, the deformity uh, increases in magnitude. The patient is often when, uh, well, this infant, but he has a persistent jaundice, fails to the dark urine. And if we do not pick it up early, then the patient starts getting features of cirrhosis and portahepatitis. Early, I mean two months. 
two months into it, I mean before two months. The more the delay, the more the problems, the more the chance of serious symptoms to happen. So diagnosis, how to diagnose? Firstly, we have to exclude other causes of jaundice. And then we have to do evaluation, imaging. In imaging, ultrasound is very important. It shows small, irregular gallbladder, no gut excretion on biliary isotope. And if uh, if patient has a delayed uh, presentation, he may find histological features of cirrhosis and fibrosis and liver biopsy. There's something called triangular sign, core sign. Uh, we didn't discuss it last year, I believe. So what is the, it's a tubular, a triangular echogenic cord of fibrous tissue, which is seen in the porta hepatis region. Cranial to portal vein at sonography. And it is related to specific for biliary, like we have the double bubble sign, the single bubble sign. Uh, it is a sign which is very specific for this um, biliary atresia. Last year, I put a question on this. So uh, we need to know about it. So sonography, I mean, the report will uh, point out, I mean, uh, the experts will tell us that there is a triangular cord sign present in this patient of obstructive jaundice. And this will make us think about biliary atresia. Treatment, Kasai procedure or liver transplant, depending on when the patient comes. Kasai most effective when the patient comes before three months. The earlier the is a presentation, the best is the better the prognosis. The more delay, the more the problem because the liver gets fibrosed. So if we do surgery, I mean bile flow re-establishing 90% of the patient, if surgery is done within eight weeks. <clears throat> bile flow re-established less than 20% times. If it is performed after 12 weeks, see the difference. See what happens in just one month. This is the Kasai portal androstomy we had discussed last year also. We get a, a loop of intestine, small intestine, and we anastomose at the hilum and uh, the bile tends to drain through this uh, loop. There are complications after this because it is, a, it is not a natural uh, pathway. It is the artificial which we have created. The patient can still have some element of obstruction, hence cholangitis. Uh, it may fail. He may uh, still tend to have back pressure and portal hypertension, esophageal varices, hypostadenism. Then he may get vitamin D deficiency uh, for this part of uh, this vitamin deficiencies, fat soluble ones, which are uh, dependent on liver ADEK. Then uh, zinc deficiency. The prognosis, no bile drainage, 10%. It doesn't work. The procedure simply doesn't work. Then 90%, they do drain. It works in them. Then with time, one third, they go into liver failure. One third, they still have some moderate element of liver uh, dysfunction. And one third, they get cured. So it helps. It helps. Only thing is the earlier presentation. These are, these are image of a patient, uh, jaundice. See the diaper. This is the aquatic uh, uh, stools, the stools which are pale. And he has a hepatosplenomegaly. He has, in fact, clubbing also. Liver transplant, the definitive management uh, if the patient comes late. Uh, survival has increased. I mean, the, this transplantation sciences, they have improved a lot in the last uh, decade or so, and things have looked better. Outcomes, prognosis is good if operated before two months, as we saw by the statistics. The problem is delay. The more the delay, more the liver fibrosis, the more the problems. Without surgery or a transplant, within eight, 19 months, the patient is likely to die. Death will be due to liver failure and uh, the uh, allied, uh, there's uh, complications like bleeding, it's visual viruses. Then call it ocal cyst. It's a congenital cystic dilatation of the common bile duct. It has again classification, it has types. But type one is the commonest. And whenever we I mean, generally at your level, when we say call it ocal cyst, we are referring to type one. This is solitary extrahepatic cyst. This is a fusiform dilatation of the uh, this uh, common bile duct. It's not that uncommon, one in one back. 
females more than male four is to one more in asia one in one uh, one in one thousand in japan so more common quite common in japan there is frequently an association of uh, there's a male union between uh, pancreatic duct and the bile duct this is i mean uh, and in fact deem is one of the causes for this uh, the pancreatic juices do go into the bile duct get activated they cause some element of inflammation and then there's a wall of weakening and this gradually dilates as we are mentioning here also weakness of the duct wall or uh, pancreatic coagulary maljunction or long channel these are the causes they have mentioned in literature clinical presentation abdominal pain jaundice right upper quadrant palpable mass you know in charcoal's triad for cholangitis we had pain jaundice and fever here we have pain jaundice and mass right upper quadrant palpable mass but like in charcoal's triad it's not necessary to have all the three present for diagnosis you can have only two so the triad is actually present only in 10 to 20 percent of the patients so there are two forms infantile form of uh, the presentation and as well form in infantile form patient presents very early before 12 months of age with jaundice uh, and uh, on evaluation we diagnose him adult form they may come after one year they may sometime they have a subtle obstruction and they may sometime land into cholangitis and come as fever vomiting jaundice nausea and when on evaluation uh, we may diagnose patient they may also have called lithiasis, called eudestasis, or called lithiasis. Imaging modalities, ultrasound is very good. CT scan, MRCP, ERCP, like other hepatobiliary disorders. USG shows ballooned or fusiform cystic dilatation beneath the porta hepatis. CT scan. It will clearly identify the cyst and it will help us in classifying them which type it is type 1 type 2 type 3 like that and that will help us in uh, tailoring the management for this patient mrcp is the gold standard nowadays it will give a very beautiful picture very clear anatomy and this will help us in deciding the surgical management our planning of surgery see here type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 everything is very clear on this picture complications Stones in gallbladder and CBD within the cyst, uh, then ah, it's very important. Malignant transformation. This cyst can undergo malignant transformation, which means it is not only the drainage, drainage of the cyst. We may get a loop of bowel and uh, attached to it and it will drain. No, we have to remove the cyst because it has a malignant transformation potential. Then patient can get recurring, uh, recurrent pancreatitis because uh, this uh, pancreatic duct, the Attachment is uh, malformed. Here may be recurrent episodes of pancreatitis, cholangitis, cholangitis. The cyst may rupture uh, and biliary peritonitis. He may bleed. Then there is uh, off-flight obstruction and uh, back pressure and biliary cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Portal vein thrombosis due to inflammation. Hepatic abscess due to infection, stasis and infection. If the patient presents with pancreatitis and cholangitis, the treatment will be supportive. Then. When the patient is stable, radical exit of the cyst. We said we have to remove the cyst because it is pre malignant. So we remove the cyst and reconstruct by uh, loop of the bowel. Complete recession is very important. Inspeciated bile syndrome, bile plug syndrome. What happens here? The bile gets thickened. It forms stone like structure or thick cream like structure within the distal common bile duct and hence causes obstructive jaundice in newborns. It's due to hemolysis or due to dietary therapy or parental nutrition, prematurity, cystic fibrosis. It has an association with cystic fibrosis. In speciated bile plug syndrome, it's difficult to diagnose from biliary atresia. In both the conditions, you have jaundice, you have alcoholic stools, you have conjugate hyperbilinary rheumatoidemia. And if we do radio and radionuclear the scan, there is no binary execution. But ultrasound here reveals dilated proximal bile ducts and it can reveal the bile, as is shown in the picture here. The thick stone-like bile. Treatment, 
it may resolve spontaneously. We need supportive management of the patient. Or we may try to give biolysis, also deoxycholic acid. If there is more persistent obstruction, then percutaneous or transhepatic or ERCP through irrigation and removal of this thick bile. Very occasionally, we may have to go for surgical uh, management I mean, to remove this bile. It's very occasional. Otherwise, this can be managed by non surgical means. To somebody, jaundice beyond two weeks, it should alert us. And obstructive causes ought to be ruled out. Timely intervention is very important. I designed this, uh, we found that uh, patient can go into cirrhosis and the prognosis will worsen with delay. So timely intervention, timely diagnosis, prompt diagnosis is very important. So for that, we have to keep our eyes open. Suspicion should be there if you have a jaundice beyond 14 days. Then let's shift to abdominal wall defects. Congenital abarachal hernia, we have discussed last year also, it's almost the same. Nothing has uh, changed since last one here. It's an imperfect closure or weakness of the umbilical ring and uh, outpouching of the omentum or uh, small intestine. Uh, the patient can come that there's a lump the parents can notice a lump when the baby is crying, cupping and straining. Most of them resolve spontaneously within two years. Most of them. So reassurance and explanation is very important. We need to reassure that uh, it will resolve and we keep them under follow up. Surgical management is very rarely required. So by two years, inshallah, most of the patients will be normal. Exome thalos, we have discussed it last year also. It's a defect in the abdominal wall at the base of the umbilicus. And we have to go to embryology. Again, it's the same slide. Between fifth and 10 weeks, we have the defect, abdominal wall defect, and the bowel is going out of the abdominal wall. Then with time, it goes in, and the defect gets closed. If the defect does not close, this bowel content will stay outside and bulge into the umbilical cord. And in a stuff covered by the abdominal wall, it will be covered by the covering, thin covering with the umbilical cord, right here. It's rare. And most of the time, about 50% of the time, they are associated with other congenital anomalies, particularly cardiac, renal, and chromosomal. They require intensive care and surgical repair. Unruptured, untreated, it will rupture in peritonitis. See, I mean, consider on the picture. Again, last year also we discussed, this year we are again revising it. The cord, the cord, the cord is attached to the sac. Cord is not separately attached. The cord is itself attached to the sac. So the sac is made up of the cord structure itself. So there is herniation of the material into the cord itself. It is different from like a hernia. Here the cord is normal. See here, it's a minimal form. Here, I mean, we can make a mistake. We can, at the time of clamping, we can clamp the gut along with it. We have to be very careful. See here, it's an intermediate size. The base of the cord, it has dilated into a sac in which there is this bowel contour. This is called ex pedos. This is a bigger one, even the liver. See, at the top of the picture, this is liver. Even the liver is there and the cord is attached to the sac. This is a giant example of us. The patient did not uh, appear within a few days and did not rupture at home. So it came here. There is a desiccation of the uh, sac and it has discovered. So management is surgical. Gastroschisis. See here. Here the cord is normal. There is a small defect by the side of the cord. Please see this image. Cord is normal. Cord is attached at its proper place. There is a defect in the abdominal wall by the side of the cord. Okay. Here, it's rare and it is not associated with other anomalies. So prognosis will be good once we repair it. So uh, the uh, we put it in this uh, in, under aseptic precautions. We put it under uh, in a 
proper uh, this bag and gradually return to the abdominal wall. If we return it into the this abdominal cavity, if we return it, patient will get abdominal compartment syndrome. So gradually, gradually, we squeeze this uh, bag and the gut enters sort of a tissue expansion till it gets its place in the gut. When all the gut is inside and the patient is stable with no hemodynamic stability for some time, we close the hole. See here. There's a herniation of the abdominal contents, including the bladder. Here, even the testes, see? These are testes at the lower end, just above the penis. The structure, those small rounded, uh, these structures here, with the testes has prolapsed. Then neonatal intestinal obstruction. And intestinal obstruction occurring during the first month of life. Causes esophageal, gastric, duodenal, jejunal, and ileal, large bowel. Oh, I mean, obstruction can occur at any level of the intestine. And then we'll talk about necroclines. General principles any patient presenting with persistent bile stained vomiting should be considered to be surgical, means obstruction, mechanical obstruction, unless proven otherwise. So the cardinal signs 2C, 2B, 2D. 2C, colics and constipation, 2B, vomiting and invisible peristalsis, 2D, distension and dehydration. It should alarm us. So management, resuscitation, gastric decompression, if we go, I mean, if it's disturbed, it's a figures. Then catheterize, give fluids, give antibiotics, after initial resuscitation, uh, find the specific uh, cause, find the uh, lesion, the location of the lesion, and go for the surgical management. Esophageal atresia, uh, we have discussed at length last year also. It has uh, five types. Type C is the commonest with distal tracheoesophageal fistula and uh, blind ending esophagus. Presentation infants, they are brought with inability to swallow, and typically uh, they are present after birth with excessive salivation, bubbling uh, this saliva out, and uh, there may be episodes. Uh, they try to feed them and they try to go into cyanosis. Uh, so antenatal history, if you take the, see the mother's records, you will find that there has a maternal polyhydra pneumonia. So what you do, you try to uh, pass the number 10 soft oral feeding tube, it doesn't pass beyond 8 to 10 centimeters. If you take an x-ray, you find this is somewhere curling in the neck only or the upper chest. If you give contrast, you find a blind ending sac. Associated anomalies are common, cardiac, renal, skeletal. So initial workup means that we need to rule them out. Surgical reconstruction. Resuscitate, rule out the anomalies and reconstruct. If there are no serious anomalies associated, prognosis is good. Then we have hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Here, neonate presence of projectile, non BS vomiting because obstruction is proximal to the uh, duodenum at the pylorus. So, bile is not coming there. Pathology there is a hypertrophy of circular pyloric muscles. And then, persistent vomiting leads to electrolyte imbalances, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, alkalosis, and dehydration. This is a clinical picture. Uh, usually it starts around three to four weeks, uh, around three weeks. Then the patient comes projectile, progressive non BDS vomiting, after which baby feels very hungry and uh, ready to suckle again. There are signs of dehydration, like uh, depressed fontanella, uh, skin turgor is less, and uh, there are visible peristalsis in the upper abdomen going from left to right when you give the test feed particularly. Differential diagnosis, gastroenteritis, gastroesophageal reflux, other lesions of the gut, or and increased intracranial tension due to this projectile persistent vomiting. Imaging, X-ray, uh, sonography, you'll find a single bubble sign here. There's a single one bubble. Because obstruction in the pylorus, there's nothing disturbed to it. Management, correct dehydration, uh, and metabolic disturbance, and amistats under the myotic. These are the images. Just you cut through the muscle and reach the mucosa and leave it. 
duodenal atresia now here you have obstruction in the third part of the duodenum generally associated with down syndrome it is common one in 25 and 5000 uh, patient presence earlier uh, after birth with uh, bilious vomiting if the obstruction is distal to ample of bladder or if it is proximal which uh, is uncommon then that will be non bilious vomiting so again there will be dehydration weight loss electrolyte imbalance it can be diagnosed prenatally also radiograph shows a classical double bubble sign we have discussed at length last year these images uh, one gas bubble is in stomach and one is the proximal duodenum and pylorus between the two uh, creates two bubbles separate bubbles so double bubble sign again double bubble sign dilated stomach then pylorus which breaks the two then there is a duodenal bubble in urinary pancreas is the uh, differential diagnosis for this condition again here this is a pancreas which is causing a block in the duodenum this is there's a neural like a ring the pancreas is like a ring around the second part of the duodenum again you'll get a double bubble sign here this is the embryology of it there are two buds ventral and dorsal uh, there is an anomalous uh, this ring formation which causes the block presentation will be seen this is a picture and so this is a neural pancreas and circling the second part of the duodenum as shown by the arrow and first part is this dilated then lower down there may be at least at any level and in the duodenum and idiom and it is the same uh, resuscitation uh, and uh, surgical management remove this uh, atritic part and restore the continuity by an osteomosis of the normal part Yeah, there are the images, the image of a picture, image of a patient, iliac atresia, uh, distended abdomen with peristalsis. You take a picture, in the erect, you see multiple fluid levels. Management same, dedicated perioperative care, good resuscitation, good post-op care, and surgical administration. This is the image. Intestinal nerve rotation. The duodenal jejunal fracture lies in the right of the midline here, and cecum is central. The base of the intestine is narrow, and due to the narrow base and redundant bowel, there can be volvulus. So there is a predisposition to volvulus. Mal rotation with volvulus is life-threatening. You can get gut gangrene very easily, and the patient will present with bilious vomiting. Presentation may be delayed if volvulus does not occur. So is the volvulus which causes the gut obstruction and uh, life threatening presentation if there is no volvulus i mean it may be delayed presentation there may patient may have recurrent episodes of vomiting self limiting or not thriving properly abdomen is distended intolerance to solid food <coughs> this is the image <coughs> management lads operation unto is the volvulus widen the base of the intestine and try to position them in a proper position Meconium edius, obstruction of the edium due to thick inspissated meconium, occurs in 10% of patients with cystic fibrosis. It gives a classical ground glass appearance. You see this uh, X-ray. There's an arrow, They're like cigarette ash or ground glass appearance. So dots, like a dots here and there. So gastrogastric edema. It is both diagnostic as well as potentially therapeutic. When you give gastrographic edema, it causes osmosis of, osmosis of fluids from the gut and increases the fluid content and softens this, this meconium and meconium might be passed. If it doesn't respond, then operative intervention. Here it is. It's meconium with the excessively tenacious, very thick and sticky and can cause this obstruction. Beyond this, uh, this meconium laden gut, everything is normal. This is just collapsed gut. See, we open it, see how thick it is. Thick, tenacious. Then Hirschsprung's disease. Uh, we have discussed it last year also. It's called congenital megacolon. Instance 1 in 80% of cases are males and maybe actually with Down syndrome. Uh, it's in fact the most common cause of neonatal obstruction, 15 to 20%. The pathology, you must be well aware of it. 
there is a, a ganglionic segment starting uh, proximal to the dentate line and uh, it may be extending to variable levels short level uh, short segment long segment 75 percent have short segment only restricted after the sigmoid colon but 15 percent they have uh, even proximal gun involvement this is the image Typical presentation in neonatal failure with delayed passage, uh, passage of meconium, abdominal distension of vomiting. However, if it's a very short segment, it may not be diagnosed up to very late. Uh, even up to adult, he may only have severe constipation or the child may have stunted growth and abdominal distension. You do digital rectal examination, you find narrow empty rectum above which there's a fecal matter. And once you remove the, this finger, there's a gush of flat or something like that. This is something very, I mean, uh, classical about this uh, down, so this hirsprungs. This is a nine year old uh, guy, another three months old. So patient, I mean, they have delayed uh, presentation is their possibility. Abdominal radiogram, it shows dilated uh, bowel loops, drop the abdomen, and then very minima. Narrow rectal segment above which colon is dilated and full of fecus. Ultrasound, antenatal and postnatal, you can diagnose it. Rectal biopsy is the definitive diagnostic test. You take a biopsy and demonstrate absence of ganglionic cells, nerve hypertrophy, and uh, that will give you the diagnosis. There's abdominal, estalicone, estrus uh, in the mucosa. So rectal biopsy is the gold standard for the definitive diagnosis. Differential diagnosis, acquired megacolon. It's a condition of severe constipation commencing at one to two years ago. But I mean, you do rectal examination, you find impacted fecal matter up to the anal verge. In Hirschsprung, we found empty rectum. Here, up to anal verge, you have storage. You take biopsy, you find normal ganglionic cells. So this is how it is differentiated. Complications. You can have severe enterocolites, life-threatening enterocolites. When patient gets uh, sepsis, abdominal distension, exposed diarrhea, vomiting, within particularly within the first three months of life, it can be I mean, uh, fatal. Treatment is surgical. We have to remove the ganglionic segment and bring down the ganglionic segment to NS. It may be done in one stage or two stages, open, laparoscopic, depending on the facilities available and the condition of the patient and the length of the segment. Here it is open. Then we have anorectal malformations, imperfect MS. The child is born without a normal anal opening. So it has two types, low abnormalities, where the termination of the bowel is below the pelvic floor, high, where the termination is above the pelvic floor. Low abnormalities, I mean, they are easy to manage. Uh, they have the normal GI tract up to the, uh, this, uh, beyond this pelvic floor. Uh, they have different versions like covered NS. It's just there's the skin cover or the NS. You just open it and everything is okay. Then you have ectopic. It is where, I mean, Gidda, Marwara, or right, left, somewhere. Uh, but it has reached its final destination. Only thing, wrong placement. NL stones. NS is there, but it is uh, too I mean, uh, minute very thin or minute opening. Or you have imperforate anal membrane. There is NS, but inside there is a mucous membrane. These are the images we have discussed last year also. I didn't change anything. High abnormalities, they are difficult to manage because you have a segment of bowel which has not been. The segment of bowel which is absent. So you, you need reconstruction here. You can have anorectal agencies, rectal agencies are like. So congenital anomalies are frequently multiple. So if you have this anomaly, you have to rule out other anomalies. So most important, I mean, uh, part of management is to classify whether it is high anomaly or low anomaly. Radiography will help. Invodogram. Um, it's not that much done nowadays, but uh, for academic uh, this interest, what do we do six hours after uh, birth? 
we say that suction gas collects in the colon to cast a shadow. So we keep a metal marker strap like coin or something at the side of NS. Infant is held upside down in our lab for three to four minutes. And then we take the radiograph. And we, then we see the distance between the gas in the rectum and the metal point like this point. If it is more than two, the abnormal, more than 2.5 centimeter abnormalities. Nowadays we can, we are doing transparent sonography or MR. It gives a very clear picture and helps us in defining the surgery also. Urine analysis, if you have proteus or pseudomonas, which means there's a communication between gut and uh, urinary tract. Surgical management, as I said, in low anomalies, it's very simple. You just, uh, you have already the anesthere. If there is stenosis, you just widen the opening. If there is a covered, you just open that covering. But the problem is in high anomalies. It is multi-staged. We have to reconstruct the portion. Yeah, the sphincters are not there. So it is a cumbersome procedure. It, is, it has its own problems, multi-staged. Thank you. If you have any questions, we'll try to find the forum, uh, inshallah. And you can ask the questions there. And we have the PowerPoint also. I hope uh, this has been of uh, the help.